Welcome to the Inspiration North podcast, inspiring stories from inspirational people and how they found their passion, their true north. I'm James Eaves. And I'm Michelle Minikin. And this is the Inspiration North podcast. Today's episode, don't be afraid to say yes to opportunities with Lisa Shaw. We talk about her career being a bit of an accident, the privilege of being part of listeners' lives each day, and her embarrassing Russell Crowe story. A County Durham lass through and through, Lisa has a radio career of over 20 years in the North East. Having worked on several of the region's commercial radio stations, winning a Sony Gold Award for co-presenting the best breakfast show in 2012, she now presents the mid-morning show the best of all the radio shows on BBC Radio Newcastle. She's also an event host and voiceover and is married and has a son. She pretends she enjoys cooking, but really just likes watching other people do it on her TV. Who'd have thought it, Michelle? We are at episode 100 and we are delighted to be joined by the wonderful Lisa Shaw. How are you, Lisa? I'm all right. Thank you. I'm honoured. I feel absolutely honoured to have been asked. To be on your 100th episode thank you very much it's our pleasure and our, our turn to have the questions in your direction and, and <laughs> yeah us. i know i'm not too keen about that. i don't know how i feel about that to be honest that's like they very much me outside of my comfort zone yeah me too i hate <laughs> i hate being on the receiving end of questions <laughs> brilliant so our first question is always when you were little did you know what you wanted to be when you grew up no it's is the short answer I really didn't I don't I don't know when I knew what I wanted to be I think actually my career and I'm really thankful for my career I've been very 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 lucky but it's almost been an accident (laughs) and I don't mean to you know belittle it in any way and kind of make light of the fact that so many people work so hard to probably achieve what what I have managed to achieve but um I think the only time I ever remember thinking about what I wanted to do when I was little I think I must have been about eight or nine Mm. and I vividly I have this memory a vivid memory of being in my grandma's house she lived in Burnetfield and I remember thinking I want to be a hairdresser not only do I want to be a hairdresser when I grew up I'm going to have my own hairdressing shop Mm. and I, I remember designing the front of the shop and I don't know why but it had a an American theme the stars and stripes were going to be the the front of the shop I can't remember what I was going to call it, probably something like Lisa's hairdressers. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I don't know why there was no history of hairdressing in the family. It's not something that I had rubbish hair when I was little. (laughs) I had like proper tomboy hair. It's very actually similar to my hair now, but my hair now is a bit longer. (laughs) And then, yeah, everything from then on in kind of was quite accidental. I was lucky in that school, I managed school okay, school was quite easy from a learning point of view. I didn't enjoy school particularly, mm. but I kind of got through it and did okay at exams. I did A-levels at the, at the local college and and seemed to be okay at kind of English. I remember an English teacher once, you know, when you had to read out loud in a class mm. and take turns with chapters and things. Mm-hmm. I was reading one of the books and my English teacher at the time, I went to Greencroft Comprehensive School, which doesn't even exist anymore. Mm. My history teacher, Mrs. Rose, asked me to keep reading. So I'd finished my chapter and she said, oh, just keep reading, Lisa. And I thought, oh, that must mean that I might be good at reading or, you know, just something that, mm. I don't know, I seem to be okay at, at English and things like that. So I did I did that at A-level along with history and business studies. And I ended up doing A-level music, which I was never supposed to do. I'd always been quite musical in our family. We were made to go to piano lessons and I learned the clarinet at school, you know, the peripatetic teachers and... Mm. The music teacher lived two doors down from me. I was supposed to only do an AS level. And he said, oh, let's just let's just do the A level, Lisa. As it happens, by the way, you're the only person in the class. Mm -hmm. And I was like, "Okay, okay, let's do that then. So it was one of those kind of that was the awkward lecture of the week going to A level uh, music. But yeah, it was a fourth A level. I always enjoyed music, would have loved to maybe done that as a career had I kind of buckled down and done something with it. But um that wasn't the case so yeah just kind of yeah ended up going to Bournemouth University this is the thing it's, it's a really kind of I wish I could tell you that there was more intention and more direction but um it got to a level you know the time a levels where you had to think about if you were going to go to uni and which ones you did mm-hmm. and 
I went to the office where they kept all the prospectuses and looked through a few and saw it Bournemouth University and looked really sunny and there was a beach and that looked nice <laughs> and found this degree called multimedia journalism which sounded pretty snazzy mm. and quite interesting journalism was never anything that I'd thought about but uh, went to an advertising open... work then <laughs> <laughs> uh, sunny beach yeah exactly yeah. Good. <laughs> when, like, yeah let's go to the opposite end of the country and yeah. make life really difficult for myself and parents but um mm. ended up going to Bournemouth and did the degree and actually ended up really enjoying it particularly the radio part of it because it was print broadcast in both uh, television and radio mm-hmm. and kind of um decided that the radio part of it was was the fun part and again we did this radio days as part of the degree where I ended up reading the news with you know one of the other guys and enjoyed it and seemed to be quite good at it and got a placement at Metro Radio when I was in my second year and in the newsroom they kind of threw everything like everything including the kitchen sink at me to try and tackle and I managed it and did it and that, yeah that's how I kind of ended up doing what I'm doing and unfortunately there was a job became available a few weeks after graduation because they said to me, if when you graduate, come and see us. And if there's a job, then, you know, you'd be in with a chance. And immediately after graduation, there wasn't. Um, and I ended up doing a couple of things. I went for a job interview. I had a, a job offer from a PR company at the same time as the job offer from Metro came. And they were exactly the same salary, £10,000 I was being offered as a graduate. So that was amazing. Mm. And I was just about to take the PR job. And then Metro said, we've got this one if you want to come in and have a chat. And um, I was fortunate enough to get that job. And that's kind of how it happened in a nutshell. It's funny, isn't it? <laughs> it's really sort of, it's almost, there's not, I'm trying, what am I trying to say? No, no, there's no structure to it. There's no reason. It's just, it just happened. <laughs> Why do you think it was multimedia studies and journalism? Because obviously there was, I presume there was more than, just that at Bournemouth University that you could have gone into, you could have studied, I don't know, film or what do you think it was that attracted you to journalism? Do you know, I don't know whether it was the journalism side of it that attracted it. Maybe it was the the media side. Maybe it was the broadcasting side because there is definitely a gene in our family. There's definitely a performance gene, if mm. you put it like that. You know, my um, parents, that they, they, they divorced when I was very, very young, but before we came along, they were part of a concert party that used to tour the Northeast and they used to do songs and sketches and recitals and things like that. And then the local church pantomime in Burnetfield, my mum was always the principal boy. And my dad now, you can, you know, he was a salesman all his life and, and, and a businessman. And that has an element of performance in it. And I think what I do now has an element of performance in it. You know, I, as well as the radio thing, I present events and you know voiceovers and things like that so I think maybe as opposed to the journalism side it was actually more the the performance side the the broadcasting side of it that perhaps attracted me Mm -hmm. and I tried the television part of it but I didn't particularly like being on camera and it was a bit more laborious I think the thing with radio is it's so immediate Mm -hmm. once it's done it's done and you can't go back unless you are pre-recording or unless you're producing a documentary or package, something like that. Mm. It's the immediacy of getting it done. That's your show. Once it's gone, it's gone. Mm. You kind of forget about it and move on to the next thing. I quite like the immediacy of radio. And you can go to where if there's something, a story breaks or, you know, you want to say something, you can say it. No one can stop you. <laughs> 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 what I think is a real challenge as well for such a role so any kind of acting performing presenting type of role it's not like a job where let's say you're not feeling 100% and you think let me just cruise through Monday and I'll get home and see how I feel on Tuesday you're very much having to almost like up the energy and the tempo yeah otherwise people won't want to listen to you and that can be hard. I think that that's definitely one of the challenges because you do, you know, I have a, a life like anybody else that has challenges within it. And, and you do sometimes have those days when you think I can't, I can't do this. I don't feel like doing this. I have, re- my, I was divorced a, uh, many years ago. And, you know, I remember that I came into work after my marriage had ended and it was 
the hardest thing in the world to do I you know the first show you you do after you know my, my stepdad died last year and you, it's almost like you you have to it's a disconnect in a way you kind of leave that side of you behind when you come into the radio studio and, and the mic fader goes up and it's it's not about that anymore you know it's it's definitely something that you you get used to and you get better at and that's not to say that you don't it's not important that you put yourself on the radio because I think that's really important mm. for any broadcaster is that there's got to be that element of personality and there's got to be that realism and that relatability and I think it's just about getting the balance right and on those days where you don't feel like performing and you don't really feel like you can bring anything to anybody else you've just got to to turn it up a little bit you know <laughs> turn down life turn up for some. yeah yeah exactly exactly but then sometimes it's it's nice to let people in you know and there have been times where I've kind of been completely honest with people and you tend to get a, a nice reaction from not that you do it to get a reaction no but it's nice when you do get that from the audience because they realize that you are just a normal person <laughs> <laughs> it's true so you, you've talked about metro fm you're now bbc radio newcastle mm. do you find there's a difference between a more commercial radio if i call it that versus the bbc is there any oh, kind of massively, difference? yeah well I, most of my career has been spent in commercial radio so i started at metro as a journalist in the newsroom and then i decided that I wanted to be a presenter because they seem to get paid more for doing less work. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> <laughs> so I um, after my new shift, I used to go into the studio at Metro, the spare studio, and I used to just practice being a presenter. It was a bit like, you know, when you, you were little and people talk about recording the charts and doing the little DJ bit and stuff. Mm. I kind of did that, but in an actual radio studio mm. and practiced. And I handed my, my tapes into the boss and said, put me on I really want to go on air prop on my own I want to do it and I must have pestered him to the point where he gave me an overnight shift and it was like two o'clock on a Sunday morning till six o'clock and um it was <laughs> it was terrible I mean I, it was I forgot to play any adverts I didn't play any adverts because I didn't really know what I was doing <laughs> but I got the uh, and that's the thing in commercial radio it's really important that you play the adverts <laughs> that's like <laughs> oh, here's the wages for everyone so yeah, I started at Metro. I did that. So I went from the newsroom to presenting. In radio, it was something you've got to get used to is the idea that you can kind of get fired like that, mm. unless you're staff, because most of the presenters in commercial radio are freelance, they're self-employed. And I was for, I have been for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So then I went to Century. I went to Century, which doesn't exist anymore, but used to exist. I did loads of shows around the clock, really. I started a bit on breakfast, then I got the evening show, and then I did a bit of lunchtime and drive, and then that changed hands, and that became Real Radio. So I worked on Real, and I did the breakfast show on Real Radio with a guy called Gary Phillipson, mm -hmm. and that was brilliant. We loved, I love work. He's a very, very good friend and a lovely man to work with. He's as mad as a box of frog. Like, you don't know what's going to come out of his mouth next. <laughs> <laughs> but we were lucky <laughs> enough to... Have you met Gary? Have you? Have you <laughs> no, it's, it's like doing podcasts with Michelle. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you know, you know, it's good. Maybe that element of danger on edge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And Gary and I worked together, and we actually won. We won a Sony award, which mm -hmm. the Sonys used to be the big radio awards. Mm -hmm. And um, we got this nomination. It was just, it was like, we, we've been nominated for the, the, the nonsense we broadcast. And <laughs> this was in 2012. And we went down to London and it was always a big, it was the radio, the Sony Radio Academy Awards. You went down to London. It was the Grover House Hotel. And uh, it was presented by Chris Evans. And like, there was just a room full of celebrities. Like Paloma Faith was on the next table to us, you know. And, the you know, there was a Rolling Stone and there were two Spice Girls. And it was like, this is mad. What is, mm -hmm. how has this happened? But it was the best. Oh God, it was the best night. And I thought, right, even if we don't win anything, I am going to have a good night. Mm -hmm. So it got to the half time kind of part of the a, a night and our award hadn't been announced yet but I thought right I am going to work the tables I am going to have my picture taken with as many celebrities as I possibly can I don't care what people think of me I don't care how embarrassing it was so I did that 
Emma Bunton said she liked my dress. Literally a high point in life. Mm. Um, yeah, so had had that great time. Got all these pictures taken, blah, blah, blah. And then the second half came. They announced our award and we won. We won mm -hmm. the gold for, for breakfast under 10 million. Obviously, there's the one above. So your likes of Radio 2 and Radio 1, they don't all go in that category. So it was just amazing. So we did that at Real and then that got taken over again and was... Turn it to heart. And uh, Gary and I, basically, you could tell from the start, we weren't we weren't a good fit for heart. So anyway, as it happened, I was pregnant when they kind of didn't renew our contracts. So that was the point at which I took a little bit of time off, but didn't really rest on my lot. Because having been self-employed for such a long time, you just don't know where the next job's coming from, you know, mm -hmm. especially with radio, because it's becoming such a small world and mm -hmm. everything is network now. It's very rare that you get local shows, regional shows. But both Gary and I did a bit of training at the BBC. Uh, we knew the editor and he said, come on in, do your training. So if we have any shifts, you can join in, you know, and, and we'll throw something your way, basically. Mm. And this is where the journalism came in handy, because he said to me, we've got some shifts in the newsroom at the weekend if you want to do that. And it was back to my news reading roots. And mm. I thought, well, do you know what? Yes, I'll do it. I was I was like five, six months pregnant and I thought I'll do it. It's only weekends. I'll have the weeks off and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so got into the BBC that way, um, was really fortunate, went into early labour. So didn't actually do my very last shift in the newsroom because I was early with my little boy. And then they said, while I, after I'd had him, they said, we've got Saturday breakfast coming up, but we'll need you to start in July. Well, I only had him in March. So I said, yes, because that's what you do. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? You just say yes to these opportunities. And that's kind of what led to me doing what I do at the BBC now. But to answer your actual question, yes, it's all about commercialism in, in commercial radio. It's the thing I found really weird when I started at the BBC was that I kept getting to the news on time. Mm. And it took me ages to realise why I was doing that. And it was because I didn't have to play 12 minutes of ads mm. an hour. 12 to 16 minutes of ads, you, you know, it was getting to the point in, in commercial radio when I was there last, where it was like, we don't really want much content from you. Just play the music, play the ads, you know, and, and that was kind of <laughs> shift storm. Yeah. Yes, it's that, isn't it? Yuck. And that's one of the reasons I love what I do with the BBC so much. You know, I'm so lucky to do the mid-morning show. It's absolutely, it's a dream job. I would honestly say I'm doing my dream job at the minute. Mm -hmm. Um, I get to work with an amazing team of producers who are so creative and brilliant. We're all of a similar age. We all have kids. And so it's not just about going in and doing work. It's about a community, a community you know what I mean? A, I don't know how to describe it. It's it's a friendship. It's a really friend. It's a friendship as well as, as a show. And, mm. and I get to talk to people. And yes, I play music and, and a decent amount of music, but I don't have to squeeze adverts in. So I get to talk to interesting people about interesting stuff. And that's kind of what we try and do on the show. Yeah. It's funny. So we've, you've had loads of our podcast guests on your show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think Donna and Cheryl. Yeah. Now is your time. Now is your time too. And uh, I think Steph Aduce has been on there quite a few times. Um, I've had, yeah, yeah, Steph. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> they're in, you, but you do exactly the same thing, don't you? You yeah. try and find the interesting people from our region doing the interesting things or, or have interesting stories to tell mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and that's why now like I say I, I am doing probably my dream job even though I didn't know it as a kid it's not hairdressing but <laughs> close second <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was really funny when we came on your shows our kind of first radio show and as I was saying before I'm off I don't like not being in control it's hilarious it's so bad and uh it was the first time James saw me really really nervous I was like what's wrong with what's going on what's... <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not good at these sort of situations so it was, it was really strange wasn't it, <laughs> it is Normally strange. Michelle's it just... I, well this is it this is my kind of experience of how people feel I guess when people come on my show and I try and be as relaxed I try not to intimidate and I think that's you know if you can talk to people when the music's on and try and relax them but sometimes there are some people that you just can't you can't talk to they're like rabbit in the headlight and that, because it must be a strange experience but yeah there are times when it can be a struggle to get stuff out of people 
I just worry about swearing. I don't know why. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm going to say a really bad swear word. <laughs> it's almost like you you want to do it to see what would happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we got the little the naughty the naughty devil on my shoulder going, what would happen if? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I'd get into trouble for starters. No, I wouldn't do it. Don't panic. <laughs> Control your guests, Lisa. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no potty mouth. Thank you very much. <laughs> What's the experience like with you're someone that for those in the northeast, when you're in the car and you're either commuting to work or traveling to meetings and you put the radio on and up oh, there's Lisa can hear some of the guests she's talking to the music that's on it's a very familiar voice over the years Mm -hmm. what's that like as an experience because in effect you are very much part of people's lives Mm -hmm. traveling to work traveling to meetings perhaps sitting at home you've been made redundant so it's your regular fix of radio you're checking in on it's you're quite you've got quite a position of in someone's diary every day yeah you're on air what's that like as a it's not a responsibility but you know what I mean it's It's a privilege I would it's a privilege I would say and I don't think it's anything I I don't think it's something I take for granted in fact I still find it really really flattering when people say something when you you know to have you say that is really flattering to be honest with you because I think you always have to be mindful of what people might be going through. I think you've got to be mindful of the different, the many different positions, particularly at a time like this, when there are so many people going through such difficult times in so many different circumstances. But, you know, at any time when you're on a breakfast show, you know, you're starting that person's day in effect. You're maybe the first voice that they'll hear when you are breaking news to somebody, you know, some quite serious news. Quite often that's your responsibility to break it or indeed to, present it within the show and I I do I I think it's a privilege and it's so nice when people say you know we we really love the show or they might say something complimentary about you as a person which is really kind of weird because you forget I think you don't you forget that you are a big part of of people's lives sometimes Mm. a lot of I think because you know a lot of people listen to radio it's very transient isn't it it's background but actually there are people it's a real and I think this is something that local BBC radio and I'm going to blow out trumpet here over the last six months has done so well we've been a lifeline to some people we've we've actually been a lifeline you know and people have said you've kept me going you know the, the guests you've had on the stories you've told the messages of hope the messages of kindness one of my producers someone rang her up and said oh do you know what time this superstore this supermarket sorry is doing the elderly shoppers because he can't I can't do shopping for him and I'm really worried he's not and she actually found a volunteer group that said oh we'll do shopping for him you know and she did that she didn't have to and she's probably Mm. not supposed to do it (laughs) but she actually she did it because she knew that that person needed help and they came to us for, for that help. That's really touching. And I think it's a position I don't ever take for granted. And I think I have to count myself lucky that I'm doing what I'm doing and touch wood long, you know, may it continue. But there's ups and downs in every industry. Mm. Definitely. Definitely. Well, we, we've always said that James missed his vocation. He should have been in radio smooth or something with his uh you know <laughs> bedtime stories or whatever <laughs> yeah What's they all relax in tones exactly yeah but this is it it's the, unfortunately the, the opportunities aren't there anymore no because it's it's network from manchester or london the majority of the time mm. that's yeah. why we started a podcast well yeah. but and this is the thing you can the things you can swear on a podcast <laughs> 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 yeah we don't we normally take a, a lead from our guests so we've had we've had some really sweary ones on but most of them are well behaved mm. <laughs> yeah i'm in i'm in red radio edit mode now you see yeah <laughs> <laughs> we do this a lot it's like look at each other it's like did you have a question there <laughs> we sometimes have these moments where we're like normally one or the other has a question it works mm. quite well with two in interview mode and then at times we're both like look at each other and it's like oh no they don't have a question <laughs> <laughs> one thing i really like with the show at bbc 
Radio Newcastle is it's very much these local stories. It's kind of like the local heroes. It's 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 not just celebrities. It's kind of mm-hmm. all these people doing some wonderful things that you might not necessarily hear about. And I think that's quite special as well because it's what you said earlier about particularly at the moment, giving people hope, that message of there are people doing good things, there are people that are caring in this world. And it's it's almost like a, the undertone is kind of keep going, keep trying things, yeah. Yeah. don't give in. Mm. Uh, so I really like that. I, I think, and you know what, a lot of the time, it's fun when you talk to a celebrity. And, you know, I'm lucky in that over the years, I have, I've interviewed, I have interviewed loads of famous people to the point where sometimes I forget who I've interviewed and I'm not very good at archiving things. So I don't have any interviews of any celebrity. I just don't have them anywhere. Whereas there are some presenters who have reels and, you know, they have tape after tape after tape and I guess it's MP3s and stuff now. Mm-hmm. And I don't even know where any of the pictures are of me, you know, photos with celebs. I think every now and again, one pops up, pops up on like a Facebook memory. And I think, right, screen grab it and keep, you know. <laughs> and But a lot of the time it's real, real people are more interesting than celebrities. Mm. It's nice to interview a famous person every now and again, especially if it's someone that you're a fan of. But yeah, real people are much more interesting, to be honest with you. And I think that's, like you say, that's the nice thing about what what we do is that we do champion the everyday people who are doing extraordinary things. You know, they're going above and beyond or they're really ambitious. I mean, gosh, the number of people I've spoken to over the last few months who've started new businesses or they're helping somebody else, they're mentoring someone to start a new business. And I think we're very, very ambitious in the Northeast. Mm. And I don't know whether that's appreciated around the rest of the country, whether it's even recognised. And um, I think that's something that's really kind of struck me over the last few months. How many people have just thought, you know what, sod it, I'm going to try this. Mm -hmm. Now's the time. Seems weird given the situation many people find them in. But in a way, it's forced a lot of people to be creative and inventive and Mm -hmm. hopefully has helped them find this alternative career path that will see them through. And in time, it'll flourish and become a brand new career for them. Yeah, it's the industrious. I think people of the north, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, we we started two businesses as well during lockdown. <laughs> started what? We started two new businesses as well. So yeah, wow. <laughs> so yeah, James has retrained, and he's now a strength coach. And we've also so he's got a business around sort of supporting individuals with understanding what they're good at and doing more of that stuff and then we've also launched you might see behind my head work pirates yeah so sorting out organizations i don't want to say the swear word um (laughs) so what we're like but it's the the tagline we have is it's like the 18 but for organizations (laughs) remember that show from the 80s plenty of our friends from different kind of people professions so yeah it's really it's exciting exciting times I'm not that type, like my husband has his own business. Mm. It's great. I go and sit in his office and kind of just pretend to type at a laptop (laughs) and seem like an important person. But, you know, I I really admire entrepreneurs and and it's not a gene. You know, my dad, the performance gene perhaps runs through the family, but the entrepreneurial one, not to me, but then my older sister, she has her own business. So, you know, I, I really admire people who have that get up and go and have that, that brain. I don't have a business brain. I don't know what type of brain I have. <laughs> I have a meandering brain, as you probably picked up from this. Yeah, well, you have two, so. <laughs> just spotting opportunities and going, oh, we can have a go at that. Mm. But that's brave. Do you know, I think that's a brave thing to do because it's it's easy to stay in your comfort zone and just say, well, I'll just stick with this for now. But to actually say, no, no, let's try something new is, is really brave. Yeah, James is not allowed to stay in his comfort zone. <laughs> Literally, they're pushing him out. <laughs> Go on. I was going to ask a coronavirus question. Go ahead then. Yeah. Is that? Yeah, okay. correct. So what's what's been the last sort of six months like work-wise? Have you had to do some different things? Um, it's been tough's not the right word. It's 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 been challenging at times, but at the same time, I think I'm really lucky because 
we have kept working the whole time. Zali um, was classed as a key worker at the start, which made me laugh quite a lot. <laughs> um, but what they did do was they changed the schedule. You might have noticed if you mm. if you kind of a a keen listener my show used to be two hours long and it's now a four hour show so they stretched the shows so that fewer people were in the building mm -hmm. and gosh it's been strange they really st I mean the you know our radio office always used to be so full of people it was so noisy it was so busy it was you know really industrious and they stripped it all I think there was at any one time no more than six people were allowed in the radio side of things mm. so um there's only ever one producer on site for me whereas it always used to be two um, we're doing four hour shows so there are a few presenters in the building and they gave me a day off so because they lengthened the shows they had kind of more presenters than shows so okay. they spread us out a little bit so that's been quite nice that I've had well, I had Monday off, but now I do Monday working from home. So I kind of pre-record shows and stuff on a Monday from home. Mm. The fact I've been able to go in to work four days a week has actually kept me sane. I think it's really helped me through this last few months. And I think I've had a really quite different lockdown experience to an awful lot of people in that it hasn't changed that much from a work point of view. Mm -hmm. my, like my husband did pretty much all of the homeschooling when, when my son was uh, off school during lockdown he was able to work from home as well, which was which was useful. Hmm. Um, and like I say, it's been it's been quite hard at times because some of the stories you hear, some of the people you talk to, it's heartbreaking hmm. and it's sad. And the situation is sad, let's be honest. And sometimes it's a struggle to find the positive and to find the hope. But at the same time, we've had so much fun as well. We hmm. we went through this phase that for a few weeks we had this woman called Marjorie who'd rang in and said. I think to Alfie on the breakfast show, why can't we do some dancing or something like to keep us all the people moving? And Alfie said, well, I tell you who will sort that out for you, Lisa. So I then had to pick up the baton, got Marjorie on and we've, we, we got um, a guy called Stuart Hatton Jr. on who is a dance teacher. Yeah. And um, he was Mr. Gay universe and he's a great guy, very outgoing. Um, great for radio. I think he presents uh, on pride, doesn't he? And um he agreed that every week he would come on, Marjorie would come on, and we'd do some radio dancing. So we do doing that once a week. We have a, a mindset coach, Morris Duffy, Dr. Morris Duffy, who comes on every week, and he's just brilliant. He's inspirational. He's motivational. He always gives you something to think about. I mean, he's... I don't know how to describe Morris. He's, he's a, he's a one-off. You know, he works with really elite sports stars and politicians and business leaders. And he comes on our show every week, bless him still. And he he does a, a spot. And so we've we've been able to incorporate an awful lot of fun into the show, mm. as well as hopefully offering people a really interesting listen, you know. And and I think the thing that local radio try to do, BBC Local Radio, is this whole make a difference campaign started at the very start. And the idea was that you are making it, you know, so many people around the Northeast are making a difference to other people's lives. And we really championed that. And I think that's been a, a very, very rewarding part of the job recently. Mm. Cool. Beacon of hope. Mm. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I turn in every day, put my mic on and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> Look up and press some buttons. <laughs> sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You know. well, I, was, I always remember thinking when we came into the studio, seeing all these dials and slidey bits and pieces it's how you remember what what does what <laughs> if you actually slide the wrong dial at, at the wrong it's moment muscle memory i think i probably if i don't know if we talked about it, sometimes people do ask you know everyone because they watch you doing it and it's it's always I was, it's muscle memory it's like driving a car mm. you, you you don't have to look at what your left hand's doing you just know and yeah <laughs> it's it's fun. Fun. i like it it's fun the button. We've got a mixer that we use when we were allowed to do face-to-face -face podcasts. We, there's, there's lots of sliders and, and, and dials. Not a clue. Not Literally, it's like on or off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Essentially, that's all you need to know. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I wonder what this does. No, don't, don't press No, don't do that, yeah. <laughs> Have we missed anything in terms of your career you'd like to talk about, Lisa? I don't know. I, this is, I, I just kind of got on with it just gone from one to the one thing you know and i talked about the sony mm. which i'm very proud of 
Who were your favourite celebrities that you've managed to interview? Ricky Gervais was, mm -hmm. I was petrified, petrified about Ricky Gervais because A, I was a big fan mm -hmm. and B, I thought, is he going to be awkward? Mm -hmm. You know, because he has, so, you know, he's such a talented and successful person. And he came in, it was when it was Century. So it was a while ago now, a long time ago now, and I was doing a show with a guy called Scott Makin. And um, he was doing a, a gig. It must have been a stand-up gig in the Northeast. But he'd had the office, you know, that had been a big hit. And he came in and I was petrified. And he was brilliant. He was the nicest person. Obviously, he want, you know, his career started in radio. So he knew exactly what we had to do. He knew what we wanted to get out of the interview. And he was he was funny, he was friendly, and he played the game basically. So that was that was amazing. I met Kylie. I dine out on this all of the time. <laughs> this, was, this was literally twenty no nineteen years ago. I met Kylie Minogue. I was at Metro, mm. and I worked on the breakfast show at the time, which was um, the to there was a presenter called Tony Horn in the morning, and I was kind of the newsreader sidekick. Mm. <clears throat> and um, I got to fly down to London with him to interview Kylie it was when she made the comeback with spinning around you know the gold mm. hot pants and everything mm. and I um, am and was a huge Kylie Minogue fan and again we got flown to London this was the old days of commercial radio mm. picked up by a car taken to this hotel and it was like a press junket you know and shown into this hotel room and there was Kylie and I don't even know whether I said three words during the whole thing it was just I was like a rabbit in the headlight mm. and she told me she liked my shoes and so that I have dined out on for 19 years now and Emma again Bunton? Emma Bunton liking your dress and... Emma Bunton liked my dress yeah anyone would think I had taste but genuinely I'm wearing a jumper from Tesco so <laughs> I don't know where that picture is there's a picture of me with Kylie Minogue somewhere in the world and I don't know where it is <laughs> damn it I know I know I've never met I was a big fan of Take That, never got to meet any of Take That, um, which is a disappointment. I've talked to a couple of them via an ISDN link before. Mm -hmm. But like I say, there's there's just people that you f forget. That sounds really arrogant. I don't mean it in, in any kind of way. It's just, I'm very much a right. This is the job to do today. Let's do that job. And then, okay, let's look at what's happening tomorrow. You mm -hmm. know? It's brilliant. I mean, there's been some awkward interviews. There's some awkward in One Direction I interviewed once via ISDN, and I think I might have ended that early because I just <laughs> couldn't be bothered. Um, but yeah, yeah, not too many, thankfully. I've interviewed, I interviewed David Cameron when he was Prime Minister. Oh, that wow. was mm -hmm. one of those moments that I think I didn't quite understand the enormity of it. And I think mm. that's kind of how I've got through a lot of my career when I was young. I said yes to a lot of things and opportunities that now I'd probably be quite scared to say yes to. Mm. But in my early 20s, yeah. I just thought, why? yeah, of course I'll do that. Why wouldn't I do this? You know, why wouldn't I fill in on the Metro Radio Breakfast Show when the presenter's off? I didn't have a, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. You know, mm. now, if they gave me that opportunity, I'd be petrified. Petrified. It's it's bizarre, isn't it? You, yeah. you grow scared, more scared as you. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just because you're more aware of your capabilities. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Brilliant. I literally this weekend just watched Notting Hill, <laughs> and you know that bit where William Thacker's little sister meets Anna Scott, and she's like, "This is an opportunity for me to be really, really cool, and I'm going to fail a hundred percent." Yeah. <laughs> so the, the question is, what was the least cool moment you've had doing your job? Oh, my goodness. Oh, so many. So <laughs> many. It might have been Paloma Faith. It might have been Cheryl. Cheryl came in the studio, uh, Real Radio, when Gary and I were doing the breakfast show. And she was at the height, probably, of her fame. She came in, she had a new single or whatever. Mm -hmm. And... I'm quite a small person. I'm only five foot two, hmm. but even stood next to Cheryl, I looked enormous. You know, <laughs> like this is so embarrassing. I'm like, 
a massive lump mm-hmm. stood next to this teeny tiny person mm-hmm. and I just remember chatting to her and saying oh so what did you get up to last night she went oh we went for Chinese me and my sister I'm Chinese and you know and you think I should be able to say something really cool I should be able to answer here and I'm like all right what did you have and you're like don't ask Cheryl what she had from the Chinese why would <laughs> why would she want to have that conversation with you and <laughs> and, and Claw and Faith came in and she's a very cool customer and for some reason she took an a total dislike to Gary. I don't know. I don't know what he did to offend her. But we were in this interview and every question Gary asked, she just like totally batted away and she like was like, I just told you that or I just said this. So I was like sat on the other side of the desk thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to carry this interview. What's the problem? Please don't, you know, don't, don't get offended by me. And mm. I don't know, sometimes the nerves take over and you end up just kind of thinking, oh, that wasn't as good as it could have been. You know, there are so many examples, probably, of <laughs> we, fangirling over people. <laughs> we did giggle this morning when we were looking for, for videos of you on the internet. And the, the Russell Crowe story did make us giggle. Oh, the Russell Crowe story, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to tell you the Russell Crowe yeah. story? <laughs> okay. Oh, my goodness. This is, you're absolutely right. This is it. This is the most embarrassing celebrity <laughs> for you. So, yeah, we got the opportunity to go and interview Russell Crowe. So he was coming to talk at Durham University because Bill Bryson was leaving as chancellor and apparently they're great mates. And he'd always promised Bill Bryson that before he left, he would come and he would chat to the students, some of the students. We suddenly got word that we might get an opportunity to talk to Russell Crowe the following day. And I was the one to do it because I don't know why I was going to be sent to Durham to do it as part of the breakfast show. Mm -hmm. But we only had three minutes with him he was given each member of the press three minutes so this was like oh my god the pressure of three minutes and bear in mind my boss also said I want you to get him to record this we used to do a feature called the 815 vendor machine Mm -hmm. and they wanted him to say I can't remember what the taglines you know the the little taglines that we used to have the strap lines Mm -hmm. but they said you must get this recorded so a the pressure to do that and to ask Russell Crowe the scariest man in Hollywood to to record this ridiculous line for this competition (laughs) anyway it was bacon hot and we were um outside this college in Durham it was just opposite from the cathedral Mm -hmm. uh, one of the colleges off Sadler Street in Durham and um there was a church in the grounds and they said right he's in the church he's just chatting to the students once he finishes then you can go in and you can each have your three minutes so bacon hot day red hot day went in this church he sat there with a big thick hoodie on he's smoking a cigarette and it's like right and I mean I'd never been as nervous as that in my entire life and um I started i got a couple of questions asked I think and I got him to record this stupid tagline for this competition and then uh, at the end of it I was just walking off and I went by the way Russell I want to say a pie outside your house <laughs> and he went good on you love and I went okay <laughs> and Mr Bryson I'm a big fan of your books and <laughs> 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 and it was like I just, it was like I carried a watermelon it was worse than that <laughs> I once ate a pie outside your house. And it was it was true because I'd been on holiday to Sydney in Australia. My younger sister lived in Sydney and um, they love their pies out in Australia. And she took me to this place, this little cafe called Harry the Wheels Cafe. And she said, get, we'll get pie. And we walked along this kind of pier almost, you know, mm-hmm. at Sydney Harbour. I think it was Darling Harbour, somewhere like that, Woolloomooloo maybe. And she said, oh, that's Russell Crowe's apartment up there. And so I was stood eating a pie outside of his apartment I just decided that I would tell him that as well when I met him. And he looked at me like, okay, that was weird, but fair enough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Move on, move on. Let's bring time teas in now. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that's, that's brilliant. Yes, yeah, that's everything. definitely the that's definitely it. No, I think I seem to be trying to forget that. I'm trying to wipe that. <laughs> Sorry for bringing it up. That's okay. <laughs> Maybe one day we'll do a podcast with Russell and then he'd be like, you don't know that that radio lady who, who ate a pie outside my house? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do actually interview it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear Random. Random. <laughs> so question number two, you can do the voiceover for any animated movie character. Who do you choose? Wow. One that exists now. Yes, let's say Disney and Pixar redo all of their movies. Hmm, that's tough. 
tough question. Mm. I'm really trying to, my son is five and for some reason, he refuses to watch all of those mo movies with me. Like, I know we got Disney Plus and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. There's all the Disney, everything is on there. Come and watch this. And he's like, no, thank you. I'm like, what? <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Can I just watch Andy's Dinosaur Adventures on CBeebies or something? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me think. Pixar, you're talking like Toy Story. A Toy Story character would be a good character, mm -hmm. wouldn't it? Maybe, um, maybe we could turn... Buzz Lightyear into a female. Maybe we could do that. We could we could turn Buzz into a female character alongside Woody and try that. I don't know. It seems like a strange process that doesn't it? Recording, <laughs> recording your voice and not really knowing what's going on. No, I love the the videos with Rock the Rock when he's doing um, yeah. Moana. Is, is this Daddy? And the little girls going nope. <laughs> Hilarious, isn't it? I know when we're in the car. If um if we're in the car and I have BBC Radio Newcastle on, you know, there's like trails come on every now and again. Usually it's me saying something ridiculous, like forgetting to put a bra on or putting my pants on the wrong way. For some reason, they always manage to catch that, that I want to say that. And <laughs> if, I, if my voice comes on, Zach, he kind of raises an eyebrow. He doesn't really react in any kind of impressed way at all. It's just kind of a... Yeah, there's mummy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if I ever have it on um, Alexa downstairs, then that station gets changed pretty quickly by Zachary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, it's a point where you become so it's almost achievement unlocked, embarrassing parent. Yay! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's not really interested it's it's a weird thing he knows i'm on the radio hmm. but he doesn't he's not bothered it's not imp it's nothing to talk about or shout you know tell his mates about mm, it's funny. It is, isn't it? cool so question number three which song do you always want in the playlist each week if i had a choice in the matter that <laughs> would be amazing i love i am a big lover of 80s music I love a bit of cheese like I love Luther Vandross never too much when we do play that I get very excited about that <laughs> great song. I like a little bit of um this is why I love doing time of our lives mm. because I get to play music that I get to sing along to um I like a bit of Cheryl Lynn has to be real all that kind of stuff you know like proper cheesy I I like cheesy disco I like a bit of r and I love playing Kylie <laughs> mm -hmm. I would always play a bit of Kylie if I could a bit of take that every now and again but I'm I'm pretty happy I quite enjoy our playlist at BBC Radio Newcastle I actually think it's quite varied because there's a bit of up-to-date stuff mm -hmm. but then you also get your 80s and you know the odd 70s a bit of 90s as well not enough 90s I think we should play a bit more 90s Start petition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can try. <laughs> we don't care. I think that's the thing that a lot of people don't understand is that we we have no say in the music anymore and haven't for such a long time. Mm -hmm. It's it's very much researched, it's very much centralized nowadays, you know. And I don't know, like I say, I think the good thing about us is we, we don't play, we're not too repetitive. Mm. A lot of commercial radio is very repetitive. They're it's like the same five songs over and over again. It's a really tight rotation. And I think that's the good thing with us. We don't have that. We're not on a very tight rotation. We're not that repetitive. We've got a very, very big bank of songs that we rotate. Mm. So, yeah, a bit of Luther Vandross always does me, always makes me happy, makes me smile. That's good. So the, the last question we ask all our guests, so I can pull up outside the studio in my DeLorean, I'm obviously wearing my mask <laughs> due to the current COVID and I've had the car sterilised. Um, we can take you back to your 18-year-old self. Mm -hmm. What sort of advice do you think you would give? Oh, God, there's so much advice I'd give myself. I think the first piece of advice is relax. Relax and enjoy the next few years. Because I think I went to university, I was very naive. I'd grown up in a, a county Durham village I wasn't a party animal. I'm still not really a party animal, but I definitely wasn't at the age of 18. I think I was perhaps a bit unsure of how I was supposed to act at university and mm -hmm. maybe the type of life I wanted to leave at university. And I think I would definitely say relax and enjoy. I think I would say talk more to the people around you 
because I've already mentioned I went to Bournemouth University and it was a ridiculous choice. It was from a geography point of view, it was a ridiculous choice because it's the other end of the country. And at no point did any of my parents, and bear in mind, I had four parents, you know, I had Mm -hmm. four parents because my mum and dad both remarried. And at no point did anyone say, Lisa, you live in County Durham and that's Bournemouth. Why don't you just find somewhere a bit nearer? Because it's not very handy. And I, you know, it meant that I couldn't get home very often. I think once a term, I used to get on the National Express bus wow. because I couldn't afford the train. Mm-hmm. And I used to travel nine and a half hours with a change at London, Victoria, on a bus to get home. I'd have, like, say, Friday night, I'd have Saturday. And then Sunday lunchtime, I was back on the bus on the way down back to uni. You know, mm. it was stupid. And I also think from an education point of view, again, talking to my parents about my choice of degree and even A levels to that extent. And it's not that they were disinterested, you know, they they worked full time, they led busy lives. There was three of us. And I think we we were taught to be very independent as children. My mum always worked full time and it was very much, you know, you can look after yourselves in a way, not not in a kind of neglectful way in any <laughs> shape or form. And I, I thank my mum for that kind of upbringing because I think it's taught me to be a very, very independent person as an adult and, I'll turn my hand to almost anything and kind of feel like I can do anything. You know, I don't feel like before I even try something, I don't feel that defeated. You know, I'll give it a go if I can. So I think talk to people more about what you want to do or what perhaps you can do or what's within your capabilities or perhaps even, you know, how to stretch yourself. Mm. So definitely communicate better with the people around you and I think work a bit harder that sounds really nerdy but I kind of again coasted through university and thankfully got a decent degree which led to the job I did but definitely if you know sometimes I think what if you'd been a bit more ambitious what if you'd worked a bit harder where could you be where would you be Mm. and definitely god get a bit of advice on your wardrobe Lisa (laughs) (laughs) like oh I'm embarrassed when I think about my my university wardrobe it was like I was always a tomboy yeah always a tomboy but it was like jeans shirts and a jumper like oversized though as well Mm. you know oversized and I don't even know there was a dress in that wardrobe for the whole three years of university it was in the 90s though that's what we wore it was the 90s it was the 90s Martins yeah yeah, but god yeah it's embarrassing (laughs) thank god facebook wasn't around but (laughs) even so there there's the odd one that pops up every now and again that people have scanned and you're like no put it away (laughs) put it away (laughs) but that's probably probably the advice that i would give myself and just keep saying yeah yes to, to opportunities because that's that's done me pretty well actually you know don't be scared advice it is yep. well thank you ever so much for coming on um and speaking to us for our hundredth episode can't believe it congratulations <laughs> on that you. achievement it's brilliant it's exciting. And then every monday since the 7th of uh, january last year we've managed to get a podcast out to come hell high water a coronavirus yeah. we've managed it so well, yeah brilliant yeah. So for our listeners, the best place to find you is probably tune in to BBC Radio Newcastle and uh, follow some of the wonderful stories from the North East. Mm. Yes, please. <laughs> Tell your friends. Tell your friends. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us, Lisa. We're really pleased you're our 100th special guest. It's been a privilege. It's been an honour. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks everyone for listening. Check out all the show notes at inspirationnorth.com. Join us again for the next episode when we'll be chatting to another inspirational person. If you like this, subscribe and tell your friends. If you didn't like this, subscribe anyway and tell everybody.